and uh, Alexander Heimel, and he's a group leader at Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience in Amsterdam. And uh, he's been studying visual system of rodents and he's recorded from a visual cortex, thalamus, and the eye of mice and squirrels. So recently he's been focusing on investigating um, the role of uh, superior colliculus uh, and innate uh, visual behaviors of mice. And uh, please remember to ask questions in the Q&A and I will moderate them um, uh, after his talk. All right, Alexander, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Mengsen, for the introduction. I'm talking to you all from the Netherlands, so it's uh, uh, 10 30 here to, um, uh, this evening. Um, so I'm discussing work uh, done in my lab by uh, mainly by Azade Tafrashia that you see here together with Sven van der Burg, Kato Smits and Laila Blomer. And it's a work building on, on previous work by these um, famous two ethologists, Nico Timbergen and uh, Conrad Lawrence. And they were some of the earliest um, researchers working on visual and innate behavior. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But while my talk will be on uh, visual be innate behavior in mice, they worked on many animals, um, but much of their most famous work is done on birds. And in particular, I'm, I'm talking a bit about the experiment that they did inspired by Oscar, Oscar Heinrich's um, proposal that um, birds respond to uh, birds of prey in the sky. So what they did is an experiment uh, just before the, uh, in, the, in the 1930s, where they had a cardboard silhouettes, they, they drew over uh, in the sky over uh, turkey chicks, and then they would uh, respond with alarm calls. And then Tim Merkin and Lawrence noted that they would um, raise alarm calls to uh, silhouettes of birds of prey, like, like you see here and here, but they would not respond to geese or uh, or uh, seagulls or um, non-birds of prey. So especially um, Nico Timbergen um, then hypothesized that there would be, that there's an innate template, a sort of a genetic, that they wouldn't have used the, the word genetic at that time perhaps, but that there would be a template for short neck birds of prey. So I'm leaving you with this question for a little while, I'll come back to it later. So, um, Similar experiments now started to be done, uh, just like we saw in the last talk where there were looming stimuli, um, also the, the lab of uh, Sam Solomon and, and uh, Di Franceschi, they showed stimuli like this, um, where you see the mouse just exploring a new environment, is, is happily exploring, and then you'll see a uh, disc appear here. And if you noticed, so the, the, the video will repeat, that initially the mouse freezes and then when actually the stimulus is passed, it runs, uh, escapes to safety to the nest. So here again, you see it freeze and it, and it runs away. So here is a slightly different setting. Now you see it from below. So it has a transparent uh, floor. You see a hawk silhouette moving across the sky and you see the mouse freeze or pause. So here it's again, it's on repeat. So you see the silhouette, it freezes and then continues what he's doing. So we see that mice, uh, just like these uh, turkey chicks uh, 80 years ago, respond to these uh, birds of prey or silhouettes. But actually already we see now that mice do not have an innate template for, for raptors or for birds of prey because they would freeze to the hawk, like we saw in the last video, but they would also freeze to discs, which do not very much like, look like a, a hawk. So and this is a, they freeze about half of the sessions on for both of these stimuli. Um, so what, what you notice if you do this repeatedly, so in the first session of 20 stimuli, you see a lot of freezing. So the freezing is indicated here by a period of, of red. So time is on the x-axis. So the first, the first appearance actually didn't freeze. The second one had froze. But you see over time, over 100, over 100 trials, you see less and less freezing. So they habituate to these stimuli. And that, that was for a uh, single example mice. Here for each color is a different mouse. So you see it's a very uh, generic uh, behavior. So some mice freeze a lot, but over sessions they start freezing uh, less. Some mice already initially freeze a bit less, 
but again, they start freezing less and less. So they really habituate in this freezing behavior to overlap stimuli. And this is to the disk stimulus, and you could think, oh, the disk stimulus, they know this is not a bird of prey, so the habituation is specifically for, for non-bird stimuli, but you see exactly the same pattern. Initially, they freeze a lot to the hawk silhouette, but then they freeze less and less over different sessions. So already we know that this, uh, these mice do not have a, a template for uh, predator silhouettes. But now the interesting thing is if you've done, you've shown this hawk now for five sessions, and then in the sixth session, you suddenly also start showing a disc, which is novel to these mice, and suddenly they freeze a lot again. And then over the next sessions, they start freezing, freezing more, uh, freezing less. So they really habituate specifically to this hawk in this case. Um, vice versa, also, if you would have started with the disc, you would get a lot of freezing in the first session, uh, indicated here on the, on the right column. But and, uh, after five sessions, they've habituated. But then in the novel stimulus, when you in the sixth session, when you give another stimulus, they would respond again. So the habituation is really stimulus specific. And actually, later on in the later, after the, uh, the original experiment by Tim Burke and, and, uh, and Lawrence, also people showed that for these turkey chicks, there was no innate template. But what had happened there, that these were not naive turkey chicks. These uh, uh, turkey chicks that they used were uh, chicks that had been out on the uh, Bavaria farmlands, where they had seen a lot of geese passing over, while there were much fewer uh, birds of prey. So what we see here is not a, gen a genetic template, but stimulus specific habituation. So, but this is still very interesting because it can help us now to probe. So the resolving power of the visual system. So what, how can a, a mouse or a chick tell these stimuli apart? But it also tells, uh, helps us to understand how scale invariance and translation and rotation invariance come about because they haven't seen the stimulus in every position in every possible way. So, can they generalize? Can they generalize over location? Do they need to see it on the left side? Um, and then do they only habituate to the stimuli on the left side? Or will they also have habituated to stimuli on the right side? So the first question, so is this translation invariance? Um, not going into much detail here, but here you see over five sessions. So you see where it's actually you saw the stimulus. So we're looking at the mouse from above and the gray points are where there was a stimulus and the red points is where it's freezing. So it looks sort of covering the whole sky. Um, if it's perfectly, um, uh, if it's only habituating to specific uh, locations, then you would not see crosses and then you would really nicely cover the whole area, but we don't see any, um, any location specific um, habituation. So it really seems there's a lot of translation invariance. So it, it suggests it's quite uh, deeper in the visual system where you get the uh, dehabituation. So this is uh, quantified by, if you look at the number of uh, free starts that happen in a, in a sector in the, in the sky that already froze to before, it's really not different from the real data from when we just shuffle all the, the, the data. Now I can ask, uh, go into a bit more detail later if there's a question about it. What I wanted to go to now is, so what makes these different, uh, these stimuli different for these mice? So of course, these were the, the two stimuli that were initially used. So quite a large disc. And uh, so these are in both in, in scale. And this is the, the hawk. So of course, there's a lot of detail in the hawk that's not in the disc. So is it a specific, the wing tips and the, and the tail? Or is it the surface area? Just the disc is much larger, how it can distinguish. Or is it the, the more the coarse shape? So the disc is, of course, perfectly the same dimensions in, in both X and Y, while, while the hawk has more an eccentricity. So this we started investigating. So the first, what we checked is, so now if we don't take the detailed shape, but just take something roughly of the same eccentricity and, and surface area of the, uh, of the hawk, can the mouse, can the mice tell these apart? And actually, they cannot tell them apart, at least not in this task. Um, so they, they habituate to both, but then, and when you start giving a novel stimulus, they still don't freeze. So they don't seem to notice that there's a novel stimulus appearing, at least not in this freezing behavior. This is perhaps not so surprising because now if you look at the stimulus that we gave, this hawk, and then if you look at a grating um, at, at the visual acuity limit of a mouse. So now if you sort of blur this image, 
uh, like the mouse eye would have blurred it, or at least um, how the mouse acuity uh, will blur it to the limit that it just wouldn't see this high this grating anymore. You also see that the hog is something left definitely, uh, which has uh, which looks a bit like an oval an oval blob. So it's not so surprising that the it doesn't distinguish this this ellipse from this hog. And then we repeated the original experiment with this disc and the ellipse, and then indeed you still see that the mice distinguish this disc from this, this ellipse. But then these are still different in two dimensions. So both um, the aspect ratio of this ellipse versus this disc, the aspect ratio is different or the eccentricity, but also the surface area is different. So is it just one, um, one of these um, dimensions that the mice use to distinguish stimuli? So first let's check the surface area. So if we show both small and large discs, do they see the difference? So actually they don't. So here we either started with a large disc or we started with a small disc. We habituated, but then when we, when we exchange the disc for the, the large for the small, or the small for the large, they don't seem to see the difference. So there's really a size invariance here. They, they've seen only one size, but then they still do not respond to the other size. So then, then we think, then we thought, oh, it must be the aspect ratio. So let's check the aspect ratio. So keep some, keep the surface area the same and change the eccentricity. What happens then? Actually, again, they don't, the mice don't distinguish. So they habituate to either stimulus. You introduce the other stimulus and they don't, and they still don't respond. So the slightly unsatisfying answer is that this uh, generalization over surface area and over aspect ratio. And indeed, a, a disc does, if you present it somewhere else, uh, not, not directly above you, would be like an oval. So uh, on the retina, they would have seen the different, the different shapes. Even if you show the disc, it would have seen an ellipse and vice versa. Um, but it's the combination of the two features in this case or the, the, that makes the different stimuli distinct enough to be uh, uh, to be told apart by the mice. So what I'm not going into now, but what would be very interesting to know is, so what's the circuitry? We know a bit from previous research that the, the circuitry will start with the retina, obviously, and probably the spear colliculus makes the, the first response that you get, directly gets the input from the retina. And perhaps there is where these is, uh, shapes are being distinguished from the spear colliculus is a path to the pyrector to gray, and then it starts freezing. But there's a lot of other brain areas, specifically the amygdala that we just heard about, that may influence this process um, and also the cerebral cortex. And with this, I want to acknowledge again uh, Anzada's work, and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much for the talk. Let's see Welcome. if there are any questions. Let's see if there's no new questions, I can ask something. Uh, I'm learning a lot now. About, oh, you. <laughs> uh, it's so interesting. Um, what I was thinking about is that, um, of course, the aspect ratio appears to be most important, but the I think the natural moving um, birds of prey will have some other features. For example, I think one that might be scary for the for the mouse would be a looming or the uh, if the size of the the circle is actually oh yeah definitely yeah that, that would yeah. be scarier than passing over no yeah that's definitely true and so much of this this recent work on on visual innate uh, behavior and defensive behavior in mice started with the work of uh, uh, Umas and, and Meister specifically on these these looming stimuli looming stimuli have been used a lot and they're very effective in getting defensive behavior. Actually much more uh, effective than these, these overhead stimuli. But what's the, with this looming, it's, it seems to be much more hardwired. So I don't know if there will be much stimulus specific uh, habituation there. So there will be, there is habituation. People see that even for these looming stimuli, if continuously something comes, comes towards you, at some point you just start ignoring it. And also the mice start ignoring it. it might be at their own peril, but there's habituation. But where this habituation is, and if we could use this for asking these questions about uh, scale and translation invariant, it might be more uh, more difficult. But it's definitely also an interesting stimulus to to look to look at. Nice. Uh, we have a question coming in. Uh, 
Is there an habituation to the speed of the stimulus? Um, yeah, so whether that's specific or not. So that's definitely a good question. We don't, uh, we don't know yet. We haven't tested it. I, I, I think there's probably is going to be uh, some specificity uh, there, but and then probably also again in in a range. So, um, but we we haven't tested it here. And for the, um, for the looming. Also, there the habituation has not been tested. For the looming, it is definitely specific speeds of looming will get the, the best response. Um, so, but if you then also specifically could habituate to one of those speeds, it would be interesting to, to test. But still, because the, all these, these experiments take quite a lot of uh, rep repetitions because you think this is really hardwired. You just get the stimulus flying over and these mice, uh, they freeze. But you notice that they, they don't freeze hundred percent of the time, so you don't actually know what what's going on there. Do they really miss it? Because sometimes we can see it's play in their plain view, um, and they don't have phobia, so they don't they don't really have to look at it. They it just pass. They they should see it, but still they don't respond to it. So this variability is very interesting, and there's probably lots of rest of the brain interacting in this behavior, uh, but it makes the the experiments uh, much longer because you have to do more. Uh, more experiments. Yeah, so cool. Uh, we are on time. We still have um, four minutes before we're getting booted out of the room. <laughs> I'm going to uh, see if anyone else wants to ask a question. Um, I will ask one myself. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm interested in rhythmic behavior. So the uh, the, whether they will respond or remember the, uh, the, the, for example, the frequency of the flapping of the prey, I, I bet they will be very different across different species uh, for the... Oh, for the different birds? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Of course, the, the, the mice acuity is really poor. Um, and most of the birds of prey, uh, of course, they, they, when, they, when they're far high up in the sky, I don't think even we could tell very well uh, mm. how much they flap and then they, in the end, they circle. So I don't, I don't know if they can tell the, the difference. Um, but there's definitely also innate behavior that seems to be like uh, itching for like, if you're, if you're interested in this, this rhythmic behavior. So if they see, uh, apparently if they see other mice uh, scratching, they also it's it's contagious just like we talking we see scratching we also start feeling itchy or even talking about itches right makes you itch but mice have this as well and then it, it also is, is by by them perhaps seeing some rhythmic uh, rhythmic motion there done by other mice very interesting all right thank you so much for the wonderful talks and i thank the participants for asking questions